Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, singer, songwriter, and saxophonist Curtis Stikers. And now, Rich Redman. What's up out there in podcast land? Rich Redman here. Yep, it's that time. Another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee. As always, my co-host, Jim. Great to see you, Jim McCarthy. Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. What has been cracking, man? What's up? It's been a while. It, Happy it's been New Year. A, we, yeah, we have like 138 episodes, 60 of yeah. which were in person. And then the world changes and it's upside down and we're stuck on Zoom like everyone else. But I've embraced it. I like this little thing. I like seeing your little avatar there. I think it's Zoom-tastic. <laughs> You're a nut. You That's are awful. a nut. I'm sorry. I, do, I, do, I can't sorry. wait to see you, though. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to everyone out hey. in podcast land. Hey, we're going to get right into it today, man. I've got a lot of mutual friends with this gentleman. He's a singer. He's a songwriter. He's a saxophonist. He's a band leader. He swims in multiple genres. Great guy. He's celebrating 30 years from his debut release. But hey, he's not letting moss grow under those feet. He's got a brand new record dropping February 25th called This Life. The one and only Curtis Steigers. What's up, man? How are you? Hey, hey, hey. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's good to hear you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how's your right pandemic? <laughs> it's been just wonderful. <laughs> I've been, uh, for, you know, for most of it, I was at home in my kitchen like everybody and uh, with my dogs and... Uh, uh, it's been, but it's it's been a time of um, even though I haven't made any money in a year and a half, or I didn't make any money for a year and a half uh, touring because that's how I made my living. I um, I learned a few new tricks. I learned how to vi- edio, uh, uh, edit video, and uh, sure. I learned how to uh, um, I learned how to do a live stream. I now have a, a Wednesday live stream show I do every Wednesday afternoon here in Boise, and it's, from your uh, kitchen, uh, I've seen it. it looks uh, great from my kitchen. Yeah, songs from my kitchen. Yeah, it's it's. It's been a, a lot of fun. I've, I've enjoyed it uh, immensely. So aside from not getting to do the thing that I do, the, the thing that I sort of define myself uh, by, which is playing live concerts sure. and the way I pay my mortgage, uh, right. I've, uh, I've, I've managed to at least keep growing and keep learning and, uh, and keep changing, which has kind of been the, the, the story of my, my career and my life as a musician is, is just sort of never stopping learning. Absolutely. And, and uh, if you guys are just consuming this with your ears, Curtis has got this great setup. He's got like guitars and saxophones and gold records on the wall. Um, and that's what I really oh, enjoy goodness. about you as a musician. I mean, you're swimming in so many waters. I believe you started on the clarinet. You play one heck of a yeah. saxophone. I would never know that you would play the saxophone because you're so great on guitar. And you can do the James Taylor thing. You know, you could emote and tell a story. And then at the same time, you can get up there with a tuxedo in front of big band and just croon your butt off, man. And so those seems to be like three (laughs) separate things, but it's coming from one human being, man. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I I, I must say I've always been a bit of a... um, a bit confusing to my publicists. I, I, you know, the first line of my new bio is I Curtis Tigers drives his publicists crazy uh, <laughs> because uh, you know, I just, it never occurred to me to just do one thing to just want to play one type of music. Cause I loved listening to so many types of music. I mean, when I, when I first started listening to music, it was on the radio. Um, I, I grew up in Idaho, but I was actually born in Southern California and I used to drive around with my mom and she listened to the radio constantly. It was like uh, um, you know, it was just everything played on the radio in the early 70s. And th- I mean, through the mid 70s, you heard Led Zeppelin and, and Deep Purple and you heard uh, Joni Mitchell and Neil Young and Carly Simon. And you heard uh, um, uh, Aretha Franklin and, and Stevie Wonder and yeah. Gladys Knight and the Pips. And you even heard a little jazz every now and then. So uh, um, I just I fell in love with different kinds of music. I also played clarinet. So I, I, I learned about classical music. And then I started playing saxophone because I wanted to find um, some music that there, you know, some pop music that, w- that, that where there, where I found more, more horn. And that's how I found jazz. Uh, and I studied jazz in high school and in college. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, 
then I started writing songs and those were more pop soul songs. I was listening to a lot of uh, Bonnie Raitt and John Hyatt and Al Green. And uh, so I kind of went that direction. And that's when I first signed my first record deal, uh, even though I had this background in jazz and I had been signed while playing with a jazz trio. And I, I say that in air quotes because we played just about everything. But we were this little acoustic trio that played on the upper west side of Manhattan and uh, um uh, but but I was writing pop songs then, so that's what Clive Davis wanted me to do first was make a, a pop record, which which I did. And the first single, I wonder why, was a top ten hit all over the world. It was crazy. I was really yeah. lucky. So that's that's a that's a qu- that's a quick crash course in my early life. It was, uh, yeah, well, I, mean, I remember I remember the cover of the record. I had it. You had these luscious long locks, and you had the movie star chin. And now you, you're, you're rocking the silver fox. I had that exact haircut. I let my hair go totally gray, and then uh, I started putting a little color back in it. But I mean, yeah, are man, you going to come back? We're about we're about the same age. So, and you know, I I feel like yeah, radio was so unrestricted back then. It was like DJs were allowed to play things that they championed. Locals, yeah. artists, the whole Laurel Canyon scene. I like. I almost feel like some of the best music ever created was like between like. 69 and 81 like that singer songwriter and uh the rupert holmes's of the pina colada song guys you know where it was just like how did this guy get a record deal he's not very handsome or anything but god he sings great i love that song and it, that never that doesn't happen anymore yeah yeah i mean again everything had a shot you know you you yeah. it didn't have to fall into this narrow nine song playlist you could you could you could sneak out of nowhere and and have a hit if you were willie nelson or if if you were uh, um i don't know tommy two-tone or i mean right. it's a little bit later but yeah. but still i mean it, there it, things were a bit more open back then um and so because of that i wanted to play i wanted to make music that sounded like elton john but i also wanted to sound like stevie wonder and i and i i wanted to be I wanted to play saxophone like Jimmy play, Page played guitar, and I wanted to sing like like uh, Robert Plant. You know, I mean, th- all right. of these things and more. You know, so uh, I, there's a lot of that in me. And so when I when I when I started making pop records, they were they were pop soul records, but there was probably a little bit of jazz in them. Eventually, I, I you know I I found that being a pop artist, uh, especially on Arista Records with Clive Davis, meant that I had to. Um, I had to listen to somebody in a suit tell me what 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 good music was, and that right. that didn't that didn't float my boat. You know, I had one hit album, and and then I started pushing away from that. I started kicking at the stall, and by the time the century ended, by two thousand, I was ready to find my way back to jazz music, and I signed a contract with Concord Records, which at that time was a small boutique jazz label, and I started making sure. jazz records. But those jazz records are those jazz records had songs by Elvis Costello and uh, Ray Davies and, uh, you know, Nick Lowe and uh, Ron Sexsmith and uh, Steve Earle and, and uh, Merle Haggard. I mean, I I like the idea of finding songs that other other jazz singers would, wouldn't even not only would they not sing them, they probably wouldn't even know about them. You know, they, sure. they wouldn't know about about. Uh, 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 songs that that I know about because I love singer songwriters in particular. I've always I've always really just I've I've gravitated toward people that um, you know set, wrote and sang their own songs. Whether or not they had perfect voices, I think a good storyteller is the best singer in the world. So I think I still think Bob Dylan is one of the greatest singers in the world. It's just not perfectly pretty, but every you, you want to hear every word. You want to know what he's saying. Um, if you can understand it. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I, I never could. But I mean, that's a that's a good angle is I love a good um, popular crossover hit played with the head played on the saxophone. I mean, how many times can you hear Autumn Leaves and Body and Soul? I mean, it's like, let's 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 break some new ground here. And that's what you're doing. Great, great songs. They were great songs of that era. And I, I have sung and played them both. Yeah. But um, but why not also right after you sing Body and Soul, why not sing Baby Plays Around by Elvis Costello or yeah. uh, Tired of Tired of Waiting by the Kinks? Um, they can be played. They can be taken apart and put back together in a new arrangement, uh, you know, that that fits the same world that fits a, a jazz quintet. And so that's yeah. that's what the records uh, that I have been making for the last uh, most of the records for the last 20 years have been albums that, uh, you know, that that took 
some standards, but a lot of modern pop and rock and country and soul songs uh, and, uh, th- and, and giving them a jazz treatment, giving them a, a small group jazz treatment. Uh, and every time I make one of those records, I try, you know, to look at it a little differently, to, to add yeah. something that I didn't add th- the time before. I mean, one of the records uh, back in 2003, uh, You Inspire Me, uh, we had Dave Tronzo play steel, uh, um, slide electric guitar, and it really turned that record on its head. It was this great jazz quartet. And then Dave Tronzo playing this this crazy out there you know, jazz, but still on an instrument that you don't usually hear jazz played on. And uh, um, anyway, I, I'm having fun. I get to make the records I want to make. I make them for next to no- nothing. Uh, and so a record company is happy about that. They don't have to, they don't have to <laughs> give me very much money. I go in and I, I make a, a record guerrilla style uh, in a few days and then do some overdubbing uh, after the fact, uh, you know, just to, just to, fix things and clean things up and maybe add one element that, that we couldn't yeah. get in the studio. But for the most part, my records are kind of live documents of what we did on those days. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, Jim, you had some time. Yeah. 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 I don't know if you know this about me, Curtis, but I, uh, I played saxophone too. Oh, did sixth you? Grade. I did. In the sixth grade. Wow. Sixth Very grade, nice. about, uh, about uh, two months. No, nice. I learned so how to so play the really MasterCard. Put- <laughs> Oh, the Mastercard theme. The Mastercard theme. That was about nice. all I learned. Nice. So you um, you put in the you put in the time. <laughs> yeah, you know, I figured two months was good. Uh, my yeah, mom did yeah. too because it was a lot very squeaky. It was funny because I wanted to play the drums back then, so uh, they decided to get me a saxophone. Y- wow. Well, yeah. Out. Well, I wanted to play. I wanted to play the drums or trumpet, um, and my my cousin Diane had a clarinet, and she had just graduated high school and didn't play anymore. So I got the clarinet, which which eventually I learned to love playing clarinet. And it and then when I switched to saxophone, saxophone is much easier to play as far as just the, the physical nature, the embouchure yeah. of your mouth. Uh, um, it's a nice but, beefy uh, instrument. I mean, and it's funny because back. Back then, you had songs like Careless Whisper and The Heat Is On okay. that really, you know, brought the instrument to the forefront. That, yes. That, I mean, honestly, back then for me, that's what did it for me. Wow. Yeah. I'm, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat older than you. I was, uh, um, there wasn't that much saxophone, at least in the 70s. When I started playing, there wasn't a whole lot. Um, the, the, the place that I found saxophone on music that I liked back then was Supertramp. John Anthony Hello oh, yeah. was the saxophone player of Supertramp. And he could play, he played clarinet on some things. I thought, I just thought, yeah, that's my, but the, the, the really, when I found a lot of saxophone and even clarinet uh, was when I found jazz. My, my, mm-hmm. my neighbor across the street, Eric Sandmeyer, who played piano, he was my age and his parents got him the Smithsonian collection of jazz, which was like a, I don't know, a 10 disc, uh, 10, uh, LP set and it had a song from you know every great starting from clear you know King Oliver and and Louis Armstrong all the way through Miles Davis and and Coltrane uh, and suddenly there I was listening to this stuff that just blew my mind you know and and then we also discovered uh, at that time uh, uh, the Dave Brubeck record Take Five which is nice. you know a good entry level entry level jazz record and. Uh, um, and there suddenly I had my instrument and then, you know, I, I had that on record. I could hear people playing that stuff and I wanted to learn it. So I joined the big band or the, yeah, the big band, the, 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 the uh, jazz band at school and uh, the jazz choir. And I really, yeah. I really started uh, devouring jazz music. At the same time, I played, you know, in a blues band on Monday nights, uh, yeah. you know, sneak, sneaking into a bar when I was 15 or 16, playing, playing the sax and, and going to uh, jazz jam sessions on Tuesday and then playing drums in a punk rock band on the weekend. All right. so, yeah. Wow. I like, I like music. Why oh, not, yeah. Why yeah. To, How many different instruments around? do you play? Well, I, I mean, I can still play the drums, but I don't very often. You know, right. um, I like I like to think that I'm a really good, loud rock drummer but you know yeah. not in a good way not like in the neil pert sense but in like uh you know the punk rock sense i can do yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so jim so jim's background just to level the playing field is he's a he's a drummer and he's allowed it to be a drum hobbyist which takes the pressure off of him and he's a professional voiceover artist and podcast nice. producer and and i've been playing drums since the dinosaurs roamed the earth and i was i became a jazzer i actually went to the university of North texas and Played in the one o'clock oh, lab band. You were in the one o'clock. Were you, were you, yeah. were you in the one o'clock with Cliff Schmidt? With I, my bass player? Um, 
so yeah, I was going to say that's our mutual friend Cliff because I remember uh, we didn't do the one o'clock together, um, but Cliff uh, was around and we played okay. like tons of like fusion horn bands in like Dallas. Sorry. I did tons of Sorry. jam sessions. And then I remember when he moved to New York, um, I, I was in this band and we would play the Mo, the Mohegan Sun, the Wolf Dan all the time there uh -huh. in Connecticut. And he came to see the yeah, band yeah. and I was in this band. We were playing like adult contemporary country pop music, like with really overpriced haircuts and overpriced shirts. And he's like, <laughs> I was like, what are you doing now, man? He's like, I'm playing with this guy, Curtis Styers. I'm like, what? Oh, that's so cool. So I remember that. That was like maybe like uh, 2003, 2004. So is he Cliff still playing with you? Well, he... He joined a little bit later than that, but um, yeah, sort of more like mid uh, mid aughts, late mid to eight, late aughts. Yeah, maybe, yeah, he's been, oh, yeah. He's been he's played with me for like twelve or thirteen years now. Yeah, he's been around, he's in the band for a long time, and uh, he, we've made several records together and toured the world. I mean, we've awesome. we've had a lot of fun. I'm overdue yeah, to reach a, out to him. Um, so, do you uh, do you enlist New York musicians? So, when it's time for you to do your record. Do you fly to New York and get the cats or do you bring your guys to Boise? Well, it depends uh, for this latest record, um, uh, this life, which is my sort of my 30th, my 30th anniversary uh, of my first record. Um, awesome. My band played um, because this new, this new album uh, I've, I, I decided to look back for the first time in 30 years. I mean, I've just been kept trying to change and find new things to do and new songs this time around, because it was the 30th, 30th anniversary of my first record, I decided to record the new versions of the songs that I had hits with or songs that have been successful for me or songs that I loved on records that never got the chance. So from my first record, I wonder why um, that was my that was my big hit single that, you know, was top 10 all over the world. We do a totally different version of that now because I tour with a, a jazz quintet or as a jazz quintet. So um, so these arrangements we've done on the road at sound checks with, and I've done them with my band. They've helped me to arra arrange them and rearrange them and they change and they evolve. And I wanted to have the guys who were there with me rearranging these songs and playing these songs play on this album. I have made records. I mean, I made an album, a big band record uh, with the, uh, the Danish radio, a uh, big band. Uh, awesome. Uh, Great a few, stuff. A few years back. And they were, they were stunning. Uh, I made a couple of records with a, with a core group that included Matt Wilson on bass. And I mean, Matt Wilson on drums, Ben oh, Allison he's awesome. on bass yeah. and Larry Goldings on piano. I've made quite a few records with Larry Goldings. He, uh, the piano player, organist, uh, he's, he's, you know, his day job is playing keyboards for uh, James Taylor, but Larry is one of the, the greatest uh, jazz, uh, I think one of the greatest jazz keyboardists in the world. And uh, he has a, a, a jazz trio, an organ trio with Bill Stewart and, and Pete Bernstein that uh, I think is, is second to none. Uh, so Larry and I have written a lot and, and made records together, but as often as I can, when it, when it, when it makes sense, I, I make records with my, with my touring band because I know how to play with them. I know we know each yeah. other and we know we, we, we we've done just done it so many times. And the band always appreciates that. It's always great for morale. And it's like, Hey, you know, we're, we're working out the arrangements on these things. We're playing this thing every night. It'd be great to record, you know? So that's always yeah. great for band morale. <laughs> it, it felt, it felt really good to be able to, to bring them in. And uh, I mean, we have made records of, of new material as well. You know, I've, I've made three or four records with my touring band. Um, but every now and then, you know, it's nice to, to mix it up. I mean, B Bill Frizzell is, is someone who has a career that I really admire um, and, and uh, aspire to amazing guitar player as, but also there's country and there's folk and there's, I mean, he, he's just all over the place and he makes rec uh, every record is with a different group. And then he goes back to groups. And I mean, that's really fun because I mean, I moved to New York from Boise, Idaho in 1987 with one thing in mind aside. Well, two things in mind. One was I knew I had to get out of Boise, Idaho because everybody <laughs> I played with, you know, even especially the good ones, they were they were a little bitter. They didn't they they weren't they weren't making it. They weren't getting record deals. They weren't they weren't getting the things that they want out of yeah. wanted out of music. And I realized, well, it was probably because they stayed in Boise, Idaho. I mean, these days you can do it a little differently. They're because of the Internet, because of YouTube, because of, you know, these other ways of getting discovered. You can probably stick around. But then you had to go somewhere. And uh, that's why I moved to New York is to get out. 
And the, but the thing I told myself, because I really didn't know how to get a record deal. I didn't know what it was that, that did that. But I knew that if I moved to New York, I'd find some damn good players to play with. I knew I'd find the cream of the crop musicians uh, yeah. in, in the world. And, uh, and I did. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. I mean, the first time I, I went to New York just to visit, uh, a couple of buddies took me out to Bleecker Street. We went down to Bleecker Street and, and we went to a place, we went to a bunch of clubs, but we walked into this place called Rock and Roll Cafe, which is right on, on uh, Bleecker off of LaGuardia. And, uh, um, and there was this great little blues trio. And at the time I'd been playing a lot of blues and, and, uh, and I thought, it was the Robert Ross band. And I thought I could play with these guys. I could, I could get up there right now and play my sax and hold my own. This would be great. And then Rick Derringer got up and jammed with them because the bass player was uh, in Rick Derringer's band. So here I am in this little club thinking I can sit in with these guys and somebody I knew from records and radio, you know, somebody amazing gets on stage and plays. And I thought, yeah, I'm moving here. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and, I, and I went home and I started saving money. And a year later, I moved to New York with not enough money. Right. Isn't that always the case, right? That is, there's never enough money to move to New York. No. But. I, grew, I grew up around New York. Oh, yeah. And in, in uh, Connecticut, did you ever get around and play in Westchester and uh, Fairfield at all or any of those areas? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I played, I played, I mean, I, I, I played New Haven. I played, you know, I played a lot of, um, you know, like house concerts and things in yeah. Connecticut. I, I remember Toad's playing place. in the, you play I toads? played toads. Yeah, we've played all played toads. toads. <laughs> I did. Yeah, that, I, I played toads my first uh, at the beginning when I first started touring as a recording artist. That was our big, you know, that was our, um, you know, our test spot. The same, you know, every, they said everyone did that. The Rolling Stones play their first gig of the yeah. tour there. The, you know, the whoever. Then, so I'm, you know, that I played there. Toads played is toads. one of those places, man. I mean, it's everybody who's anybody played at Toads. It's it was odd, and yeah. I had never known. Because, I mean, I went and saw a show there back in the, one of the first shows I ever saw. I was actually with Dream Theater uh, yeah. in 1991 or so. And, uh, you know, they had all these different bands playing on TV screens back in that time. And, gosh, they had the Rolling Stones. They had Slayer. They had Anthrax, Van yeah. Halen. I'm like, oh, oh. my gosh. It was, it was the place. Theater? It was the place you took your, your tour to right before you, you headed out. Yeah. So you, it was kind As of the, you know. Yeah, the acid test to make sure it was all working and, you know, uh, everyone had their, you know, even just like for the crew to make sure they had all their gear set, you know. Yeah. All their, um, right. So, uh, yeah, that you was played fun. Danbury? Um, never played Danbury, but I played in Simsbury, which is Sims up, all up, up near, by Hartford. Uh, up near, up near West, yeah, near West Hartford. Yeah, I used to play with a guitar player named Jeff Pivar, wonderful, wonderful guitar player um, who, who played with, uh, ended up playing with uh, David Crosby and a lot of people like that. He lives out on the West Coast now, but he uh, um, he used he kind of was the the local boy made good up there at up up in Simsbury and, and West Hartford. So we'd go up there, you know, we'd drive for hours to play for a hundred bucks. You know, I mean, yeah. that's the right. isn't that the joke? A, a, a musician is a guy who who uh, packed you know five thousand dollars worth of equipment into a, a two hundred dollar car, dollar car <laughs> and drive 500 miles to make 50 bucks so that's, yeah. that's a it's such a stereotype that is true yeah. <laughs> that's, that's oh my god stereotypes are real so, so brother, nowadays yeah. it, you, nowadays when you're traveling are you traveling with your five piece and bringing the yeah. music to the people and doing the yeah I, I, I don't think it's offensive to, to say it's more like it's like torch. It's crooner. It's like you're going for that thing and it, you do it so well. I mean, I, it's like I'm listening to Sinatra or something. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, 